missionary story today, we're going to find out the rest of the story about Hudson Taylor. Remember, Hudson was a young boy and he was so interested in China and his parents wanted him to be a missionary to China too. But Hudson was a sick boy. He was so sick he couldn't even go to school. And his parents thought he would never get to China. But God had different plans, didn't he? Hudson Taylor became a Christian and he wanted to tell everyone about Christ, even in England where he was from. And he would go and tell people about Jesus anywhere that he was, back in England or anywhere. And so Hudson oftentimes got sick too. And so sometimes they didn't even know if he would make it to China. And he did on that long voyage, he finally made it to China. And he was there telling people about Christ. And this is what he looked like wearing his English clothes. And remember, Hudson Taylor decided to change and look like the Chinese people that he loved so much. And he changed the way he looked so they wouldn't be distracted by the, the different kind of clothes that he was wearing. Well, remember, Hudson Taylor learned about medicine so he could help the people of China. And he did and helped so many different people. And last week we met a special lady. God brought Maria into Hudson's life and they were married and they stayed in China serving God. And we met Mr. Ni, a Chinese believer. He so wanted to know. Um, he was so unhappy and nothing would help until he learned about Jesus. And he asked Hudson, why were there no missionaries before? I've been waiting so long to learn about this. And that got Hudson thinking about um, how he could help more people learn about God. Well, Hudson, at the end of our story, was working so very hard, he got very, very sick. And the doctors told him he probably could not stay in China. And he was so disappointed. He wanted to stay there and tell people about Jesus. But he had to go back to England where he was from. So he was on a long voyage back on a boat. And Hudson Taylor was praying. He said, Lord, I don't know if I will ever be well enough to go back but please send new missionaries to China. And Hudson Taylor was praying that God would send five missionaries to China, five more. And Hudson was praying about that. And when he got back to England, he also took the time to translate the Bible and some parts of the Bible into Chinese. And so that means you take, uh, a, a, took the Bible and was writing it down so the Chinese people could read it. So he was using his time to do that and his wife Maria would help him do that. And on his wall, of course, he had a map of China and he kept praying for those five people to go. And, well, you'll never guess what happened. There were five people who decided to go. There were three men and two women who heard about Hudson Taylor and the work he was doing in China, and they said, yes, we will go to China too. And so when Hudson Taylor left China, five more people went. And so he was thinking, you know, there are 11 different provinces in China, and I'm going to pray for more. But Hudson started to get afraid. And this time, he really didn't obey God. He was, God was telling him, ask for more people. And Hudson said, but, but it's, it's dangerous, and I don't want to be responsible for those people. What if they get hurt there? Or what if something happens? And so Hudson Taylor did not pray for more. And guess how he was feeling? 
miserable. He wasn't feeling happy at all because he wasn't doing what God was thinking. And so one Sunday morning, he was in church in England and he was thinking about the Chinese people and he was just wrestling in himself, thinking about how these uh, English people Christians are seem so happy and, and he was not and he left the church service and he went over to a beach nearby and he was walking and he was thinking about what God wanted him to do and then he said yes Lord I will pray for more people and I am going to pray there's 20 four people in all he was going to pray for 11 provinces two people each and then one extra place called Mongolia he wanted 24 new missionaries to go to China and that's what he decided he would pray for and guess how he felt after that he felt happy and he started a mission society called the China Inland Mission it was like a company that would help people get to China. And Hudson Taylor was able to raise money for those people. He raised $53,000 so that those 24 people could go to China. So think back to that little boy sitting at that table thinking, I want to go to China someday. And when God brought him back to England, there were 24 more missionaries, plus those five, and he started the China Inland Mission, and so many more people were able to go. And Hudson and his wife and their children all went back to China to tell more people about Jesus. And Hudson Taylor had a very famous uh, saying. He would say, God's work done in God's way, will never lack God's supply. So he was saying that if it's God wants it done, God will provide. God will take care of all of their needs. And God did. Some people thought that they were foolish and that they shouldn't go to China. But Hudson would always answer, God's work done in God's way, will never lack God's supply. Well, people thought Hudson Taylor was crazy because look at these numbers. The first, next time, he asked God to send 70 missionaries over and look what God gave them, 78. And then Hudson prayed for 100 missionaries and 102 went over. And then he prayed for 1,000 missionaries and they got 1,153 missionaries. And so Hudson Taylor, that one young boy, was able to start that mission society because he loved God and he loved the people of China and he wanted them to know about God and so that one boy who obeyed God, who trusted God, was able to send over that many missionaries. What a difference they must have made to the people in China. But Hudson Taylor was a missionary everywhere that he went. And I hope you'll think about being a missionary too. In your neighborhood, in your family, Hudson loved God and he wanted everyone to know about God. So I hope that you'll think about that too, how you can be a missionary in your very own town, in your very own church and school.
For our Bible lesson today, we're going to finish up our story about how God chose Abraham's family to be the leaders of his chosen people. And this was Abraham. And Abraham and his wife Sarah waited a long time to have their son Isaac. And Isaac had two sons and then some more. And so here is Isaac with his sons, Jacob and Esau. And last week we learned how Jacob and Esau mm, didn't really get along too well. They were very different. And so we saw how Esau loved to hunt and be outside and Jacob liked to cook and be inside. And remember Esau was the older son. And so he would get the birthright and the special blessing. And Jacob tricked him out of it. And he said, I'll give you some stew if you'll give me the birthright. And Esau did. And then his mother, Rebecca, knew that Esau was going to get the special blessing. And so Rebecca told him a trick. And let's trick your father into giving you the special blessing. And so remember, he went and got some goat's hair and got the goat. And he got the special blessing, even though it wasn't his right but remember, when those babies were born, God told them what would happen. God knew, and God had chosen Jacob. And God even gave Jacob a special dream where he could see heaven's gates opened up and angels coming up and down this special stairway to heaven. You see, even though Jacob had tricked Esau, God was with him and God had chosen him. But Jacob had to go on a long journey to get away from his brother Esau. And so Jacob is on his way back to the city of Haran where they had started the journey. And so Jacob is on this very long journey. A lot, two weeks all by himself. He ended up back at Haran and at his uncle Laban's house. And when Jacob got there, he opened up the well and he asked the people where they were from. And the, the people said, oh, we are from the house of Laban. And he said, Laban, that, those are my relatives. And so Jacob went back with this girl named Rachel back to his uncle's house. And so he would stay there with his uncle Laban and he stayed there and became part of their family. And guess what? God blessed Jacob while he was there. And Jacob asked Laban if he could marry one of his daughters, his daughter, whose name was Rachel, because Jacob loved her very much, but she was the younger sister. And so Laban said, why, sure, you work for me for seven years, and then you can marry my daughter. And so Jacob worked for his uncle Laban for seven years. And when that time uh, was up, Jacob got married. And the wedding happened, and you know, those brides, she had a veil over her face, and they had the wedding ceremony, and then Jacob discovered he had not married Rachel. He had married the older sister. He was not very happy with his uncle, and he said, what have you done? I asked to marry Rachel, and his uncle said, well, the older sister must get married first, so there you go. And so Jacob had been tricked. Hmm, does that sound familiar? Jacob had tricked his brother. Jacob had tricked his father, and now Jacob was the one who had gotten tricked. Perhaps God wanted to show Jacob what it was like and what it felt like and to see how wrong that it was. And so he was upset. But in those days, in those times, it was sometimes customary for people to have more than one wife. And so he worked for seven more years and then Rachel became his wife. 
and God blessed Jacob very much. So he would work sometimes for animals and things like that. That's that's how they would um, get money then. And so Jacob got some crops and got some animals. And so he said, uh, his uncle said, well, I will give you all the speckled uh, sheep. And so guess what would happen? Lots and lots and lots of speckled sheep would be born and Jacob would be very blessed. And then his uncle would change his mind and say, well, now you can have only the white sheep. And so all of a sudden, more and more white sheep were being born. And so Jacob was being blessed by God because he was chosen and he was changing Jacob as they were going. Well, finally, Laban got tired of Jacob being there and taking all of his, his animals and all of his things. And so Jacob decided it was time to return back to his land where he was before. And so they are all packing up all of their things and they are going to get ready to go back. There's Rachel and Leah and his two wives. And God also blessed him with many children. His, he had 11 sons and one daughter. Now, the wife that he loved the most, Rachel, at this point, she only had one child, and his other wife had had the other ones. And so at this point, he has 11 sons and one daughter. And so Jacob is getting ready to go home. Now remember, who was at home waiting for him was the brother Esau who hated him. And so as he's getting closer and closer on his way home, Jacob is praying. And Jacob knows that Esau wants to kill him. And he stole those things from Esau. And so now he is praying. And so they're on their way back. When they get closer... Jacob has a plan. He's going to separate his family into groups and keep them safe. So if Esau comes and Esau, they get a message. They sent a messenger ahead and they said, your brother Esau is coming and he has 400 men with him. He's ready to attack. And so Jacob is praying and Jacob is planning and he separates them out and he goes on up ahead. And he also sends some uh, gifts to his brother Esau as kind of like an apology, right? And so he sends some gifts ahead and, and says, we're coming in peace. And he's praying about what is going to happen. And so his family is waiting in the back. He has some of his servants who are soldiers ready to go. And it's nighttime. And that night, something strange happened. Jacob thought he was all alone when a man was there with him. And the man began to wrestle with Jacob in the darkness. And Jacob and this man wrestled all night long. That's a long time. Finally, the man injured Jacob by touching his thigh and putting his thigh a little bit out of joint. And so now he has to, to limp around a little bit. And he's told the man, I'm not going to let you go until you bless me. Because Jacob knew that this was a heavenly visitor. God had come down and wrestled with Jacob. And the man said, what is your name? And Jacob said, Jacob. And he said, no longer will you be called Jacob you have a new name. Your new name is going to be Israel. Israel. That name sounds familiar, doesn't it? Israel. It means prince with God. God changed Jacob's name and made him a new person. God, and you can see how Jacob was changing through the story, can't you? He was the tricker. And then he got tricked and he saw and he prayed and he became a man of God because God chose him. God was changing Jacob. 
And God wants to change us too. God wants us to become more like him every single day. And in every little way, we need to try to become more like Jesus. He wants us to change. When we first become Christians, we are used to being sinful. And then God wants us to change those ways and think about him and become more like him. And God was changing Jacob into a new man. Now, Jacob limped after that because when he wrestled with that heavenly visitor, he was limping and he limped across and he joined his family and he saw Esau, his brother, approaching with his 400 men. And when they came up, I'm sure they were very scared, waiting to see what was going to happen. What would Esau do? And when Esau saw Jacob, he ran to meet him and he hugged him and he kissed him and they both wept and they cried and their families must have been so happy to see that the brothers were together peacefully. And Jacob returned home to the promised land, the land that God had given them. But his name wasn't Jacob anymore. Now his name was Israel. And you might know that name because we often call Jacob's family the children of Israel. Maybe you remember there were 12 tribes in the children of Israel. And Jacob ended up with 12 sons. And so his family grew and grew and God blessed them because God chose them to be his special people. And that all started in the book of Genesis. And you can read in the rest of the Old Testament some of the stories about the children of Israel, but they all started out with Abraham who trusted God and obeyed him, and Abraham's son, Isaac, who almost got sacrificed on an altar, and then Isaac's two twin boys, Jacob and Esau, and God chose Jacob and changed his name to Israel as God's special chosen people. And so God is in charge, God is in control, and we can trust God for his plans for our lives because we can see all throughout the Bible how God keeps his promises, how God leads his people. And God wants to do that to you too. God keeps his promises today. This is an Old Testament story, but God is still keeping all of his promises. And his most special promise that he made was the promise of sending Jesus, his son. And Jesus was born into the family of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. He was a descendant, a relative of theirs. And that is what God was promising to the people back then. And of course, that is the promise to us, that if we trust in Jesus, he will take our sins away, forgive our sins, and we trust him. We can be God's children too, just like the children of Israel. Everything's falling apart and it feels like I can't do anything about it. Hey guys, it's me again, Douglas. And today I wanted to talk to you guys about you know, helping those in need. I wanted to talk to you about dealing with really big problems, right? Because it seems like the earth right now has lots of really, really big problems. You know, there's people who are sick and there's people who are in danger and there's all kinds of terrible stuff happening to the planet and there's just all kinds of bad stuff going on. It seems like that's all I ever hear about is people talking about bad stuff and really big bad stuff. There are so many people out there who need help. There's so many things that need doing. And I'm just me. I'm just one little Douglas and the world has so many big problems. I wish I could just give the whole world one big hug because there's so many hurting people. But I can't even, you know, wrap my arms around a watermelon, let alone the world. And so I've really been, you know, upset about this for a while. I, I, I've, been, I've been really frustrated and, and angry and, and feeling like, like I'm worthless, like I can't do anything. But... I think I know what I'm supposed to do. 
you know, instead of just going bananas, I decided I was going to sit down, I was going to pray, and I was going to read my Bible, and I was going to, you know, talk to people that I respect and look up to and, and see what they think. And I wanted to share the stuff that I've been learning through this. And I, I would totally suggest that you do the same thing that I did, you know, the, the sit down and pray and read your Bible and talk to people that you look up to, ask for their advice. But I want to share the stuff that I've been learning in the hopes that maybe it'll help you too. And first of all, I think it's important for us to recognize that the problems in this world are super big and we cannot fix them all. Only God can fix the world's problems. We might have been the ones to mess it up, but it's only God who can fix it. But you can be a part of God's plan to make the world a better place. God wants to use you to help. You know, the Bible says that the church is like the body of Christ, right? All believers are a part of the body of Christ, and it's our job to share the good news of Jesus Christ, to share God's love with the whole world. You know, it's funny because I learned the other day that like muscles really don't do a whole lot. Yeah, most muscles, they can only do two things. They can squeeze and release, and that's it. But like I can, you know, dance and I can, I can walk and I can run and I can do all kinds of stuff. I can do a lot more than just squeeze and release. And that's because I got all kinds of muscles and bones and ligaments and all kinds of stuff working together to make something happen. I feel like a lot of people are looking at the big problems of the world and thinking, well, I can't do anything about the big problems, so I'm going to do nothing. And that's not good. You may not be able to do a whole lot, but the little bit that you can do, God can use to make big things happen. Now, like, I'm not super, I'm not like a doctor or anything like that, so I don't know all the different bones and all the different muscles and stuff like that, but I'm pretty sure that my pinky toe, I can wiggle my pinky toe. And wiggling my pinky toe doesn't do a whole lot. But I'm pretty sure that when I take a step, I'm wiggling that pinky toe. It might not seem like a whole lot, but it's part of the action of taking a step. It helps. And you may not have a whole lot. You may not be able to do a whole lot, and that's okay. Just do what you can, and God will take care of the rest. And so if you are looking at all the problems in the world like I've been, and you are just losing your mind going bananas, I want you to take a deep breath. <sighs> And I want you to realize that you can't fix all the world's problems. God can. You can't. But you can do something. There's all kinds of things that you can do. Like maybe you don't have a lot of money. And so you can't give a lot of money if you don't have a lot of money. But maybe you've got a little money. And you could give a little bit of that little money to someone in need. And God could take that and do big things with it. And maybe you don't have a lot of time. But you could take a little bit of the little bit of time that you do have and share God's love with someone with that little bit of time. Maybe there aren't many people that you know of that are struggling, but maybe you know somebody who's struggling, or maybe you know somebody who knows somebody who's struggling. You don't have to help a million people. You could help just one person, and you don't have to fix all their problems. You can just help with what you can help with. You don't have to change the world to change the world. Any good thing that you do, no matter how little it is, God can use to do big things. And I'm not saying don't try to do big things. Some people have done some really big, amazing, cool things, and that's awesome. And we should look up to them and try to imitate them. But you can't do everything yourself. But you can do something. And even the littlest, tiny baby toe can help move the body of Christ to help further the kingdom of God. Hey guys, I hope you liked this video. And hey, have you checked out my Patreon page yet? Yeah, patreon.com slash Douglas Talks. Patreon is a great way to help support the ministry of Douglas Talks. Yeah, so all those people over there with their names scrolling up, those are my patrons. Those are some of the people that have helped support Douglas Talks through Patreon. And depending on how much you choose to give, there's different like levels, there's different rewards and things. And one of the rewards is a shout out to the ministry of your choice. For example, one of those ministries is called Family Life Ministries. Yeah, they have a radio station and they do concerts and theater shows and all kinds of other things to reach people with the message of hope. And they especially love kids. And every Saturday morning, Mr. Jacobs and his friends on the kids' corner, they talk about God and sharing his love with the people that God puts in our lives. Their website is fln.org. And if you want to listen to episodes of the kids' corner, you can just go to fln.org slash kids. There's tons of episodes to listen to in a monthly coloring contest, too. You should totally check them out. And hey, if you'd like to hear a shout out to your favorite ministry, check out patreon.com slash Douglas Talks to learn how. 
always make sure that you have your parents' permission before you do anything online. Thanks, guys. This is called Just Like That. Here we go. It don't matter what you look like, how light or dark your skin, a big and tall or short and small, you were made that way by him. Every toenail, kneecap, ear and nose are part of his design. He made you full right here and now. He made you right on time. Yeah, Jesus loves you, this I know. For the Bible tells us so. He made you perfect, perfectly. A precious in his sight, you see. He made your friends and neighbors too. And they are precious just like you. So serve the Lord with thankfulness that He made you just like that. Did you know that every color is made that way by Him? We should love our neighbors like ourselves and try our best to be a friend. Be proud of what and who you are. God has so much in store. You know the birds and the bees and the rocks and the trees. God loves you even more. Yeah, Jesus loves you, this I know. For the Bible tells us so. He made you perfect, perfectly. A precious in His sight, you see. He made your friends and neighbors too. And they are precious just like you. So serve the Lord with thankfulness that He made you just like that. Yeah, Jesus loves you, this I know, for the Bible tells us so. He made you perfect, perfectly, precious in His sight, you see. He made your friends and neighbors too, and they are precious just like you. So serve the Lord with thankfulness that He made you just like that. So serve the Lord with thankfulness that He made you just like that. Hey, CBC Kids! Have you ever thought about how amazing this place is? Well, I don't mean my office or the ministry center where I am right now. I mean this world that we live in. It's full of beautiful, majestic sights. Sometimes it's even enough to take your breath away. I mean, especially when you see something like the Grand Canyon in person. That thing's ginormous. I'm not sure if you've ever seen it, but it's huge. And everywhere you look, the earth is teeming with life. There's such a variety of plants and animals, and all of them point to the wisdom and power of God who made them all. Did you know that the Bible talks about this? It says that since what may be known about God is plain to them, because God has made it plain to them, for since the creation of the world, God's invisible qualities and his eternal power and divine nature have been clearly seen being understood from what has been made. One of those wonders is something like the life cycle of a butterfly. It starts off hatching from an egg as a caterpillar, and it finishes as a beautiful winged flying insect. Watch this cool video from SciShow Kids that tells all about that amazing journey. We'll put a link in the video. Uh, we'll put a link to that video in the description below this so that you can visit their channel and watch it again later if you want to. But I'll see you right back here after the video. been solving riddles all week, and I thought you might know this one. What starts its life as an egg, then it walks on many legs, and then it uses wings to fly? A butterfly! I bet you've seen a butterfly. And have you heard the saying, if you've seen one, you've seen them all? 
That's not true with butterflies. There are over 17,000 different kinds of butterflies, and they come in all kinds of colors and patterns. But all butterflies have one thing in common. They all used to be caterpillars. So how did this become this? Well, butterflies go through four stages in their life that turn them into beautiful insects that we see flying around. Together, these four stages are called metamorphosis, which comes from the Latin words for changing shape. So what are these four stages? Stage number one, the egg stage. During the egg stage, a mama butterfly will fly from plant to plant, and when she finds the perfect one, she'll lay her eggs on it. Itty bitty, teeny tiny little caterpillars live inside those eggs. When they're ready, these tiny little caterpillars chew their way out of their egg, and now we've reached stage number two, the larva stage. The hungry caterpillar then crawls out of its egg, and then it eats its eggshell, and then it eats the leaf it's on, and probably the leaf next to it too. Did I mention the caterpillar is really hungry? All the food that the caterpillar eats helps it grow bigger and bigger until it's too big for its own exoskeleton. The caterpillar then molds its exoskeleton, but don't worry, it's already grown a new one underneath to replace it. The new exoskeleton is a little small, so to fix this, the caterpillar gulps in air to expand itself, and then it waits and lets its exoskeleton harden. But soon, that new exoskeleton doesn't fit the caterpillar either. It molts and regrows its exoskeleton again and again, usually about four or five more times. After all that molting and regrowing, the caterpillar is ready to take a break. In stage number three, the pupa stage. The caterpillar finds a sturdy branch or stem to hang upside down from. It molds its exoskeleton one final time, regrowing a new layer called a chrysalis. Inside the chrysalis, the caterpillar isn't really a caterpillar anymore, but a pupa. A pupa is an insect when it's in between being a baby, like a caterpillar, and an adult, like a butterfly. The chrysalis has a hard shell to protect the soft pupa while it changes into its adult form. Inside, it regrows its six legs and antenna and adds wings. The pupa stays inside the chrysalis for 10 or more days. And then one day, the chrysalis moves, and it slowly cracks open, and the butterfly crawls out. Well, a really soggy looking butterfly, its wings are crumpled and wet. This is stage number four, the butterfly stage. Once the butterfly is out of the chrysalis, blood will start pumping to its wings, helping them to straighten and dry out. Now the butterfly is ready to fly. Fly to some food. 10 plus days without food means this butterfly is ready to eat. Butterflies drink nectar, a sugary liquid found in flowers. And sometimes they like to eat rotting fruit or even dead bugs. Butterflies take in their food through a long tube called a proboscis, sort of like how we drink a milkshake through a straw. But they can't taste food with their proboscis. Can you guess what they do taste with? their feet. When a butterfly lands on a flower, it can tell if the flower is sweet by tasting it with the tips of its feet. If they like the way it tastes, they'll drink the flower's nectar. Now, full of food to keep it strong, the butterfly is ready to, well, be a butterfly. And that's how a caterpillar becomes a butterfly. Now Squeaks and I are gonna go outside and see if we can spot one. And I hope you do too. See you next time on SciShow Kids. That was amazing. It's hard to believe how different this creature was from the time that it was a long, chunky caterpillar crawling around on branches to the time when it breaks free from its chrysalis as a majestic butterfly. <laughs> I thought I looked different now from how I looked in my junior high days, but that's nothing compared to the transformation that happens to turn a caterpillar into a butterfly. Have you heard that word before? Transformation? It's just a big word that means very big change. You know what's really cool? The same God who made the process that makes the butterfly uses that idea when he talks about the way he changes people like me and like you when he saves them. When God saves a boy or a girl, a man or a woman, he begins a process that will make amazing changes in that person. Listen to what the Bible says. It says that we all, with unveiled face, beholding as in a mirror the glory of the Lord, are being transformed into the same image. When God saves a person, he begins the process of making them to be like Jesus. That's why the Bible also says, therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he's a new creature. The old things are passed away. Behold, new things have come. 
And just like with the butterfly, this doesn't just happen all at once. It begins at a point in time when God changes a person's heart so that they're willing to admit that they're a sinner. And that's what we mean when we say repent. And they're willing to ask Jesus to save them. This then is transformation continues over time as Christians become more and more like Jesus. And much like the transformation of the butterfly, the change happens first on the inside and then it works its way out. God first changes how we think and what we love, and that affects how we live over time. This is why the Bible encourages us in this process when it says, Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, so that you may prove what the will of God is, that which is good and acceptable and perfect. Boys and girls, I hope you have admitted to Jesus that you're a sinner like I have and asked him to be your savior. If you haven't, you can ask your mom and dad even today how a person does that. If you have done that, you can thank God with me that he makes it possible for us to obey him a little better each day so that we're being transformed to be more like Jesus. I'm very thankful that God loves us like that and makes a way for us to be rescued from our sin and become more like Jesus. I hope you are too. I'll see you next time. Bye-bye. Hads, it's Monday. So what does that mean? Show your art. Yeah, and we're going to draw something. Mm -hmm. What are we drawing? A butterfly. Now we're drawing a butterfly today, right? Yes. Who are we drawing it for? Peyton. Yes, my cousin Peyton, she's super cute. She wanted us to draw a butterfly. Mm -hmm. So this one is for you, Peyton. We love you very much, and thanks for being our awesome art friend. All right, you ready to draw it? Yes. Okay, let's draw a butterfly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay, we're going to start with our paper vertical, and we're going to draw a cartoon version of a butterfly. Mm -hmm. So it's going to be super cute, and we're going to keep it really easy for your young art friends. Okay? Yeah. All right, you ready for the first step? Mm -hmm. First step we're going to draw is the butterfly's head. And we're going to draw a little circle right in the middle of our paper. Like okay. that. A cute little head for a butterfly. Okay. <laughs> yes. Keep going. Good job. Now let's draw the butterfly's eyes. And we're going to draw little circles sticking out. But they're overlapping. Is that funny? Mm-hmm. <laughs> Good. Now we're going to draw a little circle at the top. This is going to be for the light reflecting off his eyes or her eyes, and we're going to color in the rest of the, the big circle and leave the small one white. Okay. Does that look like a butterfly head? No. <laughs> All right, let's keep going then. <laughs> we're going to draw the antennas next, so we're going to draw a little curl. Good, and right at the end, we're going to curl around and create a little spiral. Good job. And then on the other side, we're going to do the same thing. Draw a little curve that comes up, and we'll spiral. A little curl or a spiral. Is that a cute antenna? Mm -hmm. All right, now let's draw the body. And we're just going to draw a really small U. But it's actually tall. But not too tall. Not too tall. So it's super cute. Good job. <laughs> okay, now let's draw her wing. And it's going to be a really big wing. And it's in the shape of a bee. So a little bump, two bumps, and then back into the body. Okay. Is that a cute wing? Mm -hmm. Go out, and then a bump, and then another bump, and then back into the body. Good job. That was pretty easy. <laughs> Looks like a heart. Yeah, it does, on the side. <laughs> okay, let's draw her other wing, okay? okay. And we we're going to try and draw it the same size. Is that too big? Or about the same? We'll come in, we'll do another bump, and then into the body. Can you draw another wing over here? Yeah. Okay. Good job, you did it. That's a really cute butterfly. <laughs> Let's put a design on the wings. Okay. Okay, really simple one. We're just going to do a circle inside of her wing. Good, and we'll draw another circle on this side. Awesome, and then we'll do a smaller one over here. And then a small one over here. Was that fun? Yes. Give me five. 
We need a color, don't we? Yes. Okay, let's pick out our colors, and we'll come right back. Okay. Okay, we got our colors picked out, and we're going to do different colors, right? Mm -hmm. We picked our own colors. I'm going to do a light blue and a pink, but we forgot something to draw on our butterfly. Yes. What did we forget? Um, his legs. Yeah, we forgot the legs. Mm -hmm. So let's draw three little lines on each side. So one coming, three coming out on this side, and three sticking out on this side. Now it looks like a butterfly. <laughs> <laughs> All right, you ready to fast forward? Yes. Okay. Good job, Had. She turned out awesome. Give me five. What's her name? Um, Lillian. Lillian. <laughs> Mine's Fred. <laughs> you know, one thing we could do with our butterflies is we could add an action line to show where our butterfly is flying. So I'm going to draw a dash line. Look at this. We're going to draw a dash line. It goes around, and maybe my butterfly did a little flip. Watch this. So we're going to do a little dash line. It's going to come around in a circle. Look at that. Is that funny? Mm -hmm. So she did a little flip, or he did a little flip. It's Fred. <laughs> <laughs> and then went right off the page. Do you want to do that? Yeah. I really like where your butterfly's flying. She's very crazy. <laughs> Super crazy. Maybe she was listening to music. <laughs> now, you guys at home, don't forget to draw the backgrounds, too. We're going to leave our drawings just like this, but you want to color in the background so that it looks awesome. Maybe she's flying around in flowers, <laughs> or maybe she's flying around in a picnic and bugging somebody. <laughs> also, the cool thing about these butterflies is you can draw any decoration on the wings that you want. We did two little spots, but you guys at home could draw stripes, or you could draw more spots. And do they have to use the same colors that we use? No. No, you guys can pick your favorite colors and color your butterflies your own way. Mm -hmm. We hope you guys had a lot of fun drawing your butterflies with us. We still